Well, welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I just want to pop on here for a minute, um, show my ugly face, so to speak, and uh, say hi. I'm going to turn my video camera off a little bit and go to put directly to the presentation. But I just wanted to say thanks for everybody for sticking with us through the series. This is the fifth of six webinars in the series, and uh, hopefully there's some new information. Those of those you attended some of the sessions the last um, few sessions have hopefully learned something and I'm um, hoping to bring some new things for you as well um, during uh, during this session. So uh, we have a few people joining uh, joined already and I think we probably have a few more that are coming. So as you are getting logged in, um, hopefully you can see the presentation and I'm going to turn off my camera so I don't you have to look my ugly mug, but at least you know who I am at this point. Um, so this is um, uh, part five of the series. We've got a six part coming up here. And we're really focusing on this one on two independent topics that are really uh, powerful and impactful, I think, to the environment we're living in today. Um, and uh, so we're gonna uh, talk about responding to a cyber incident. Uh, and this is gonna give you some context, I think, in around uh, for, for SaaS applications, particularly in around the new guidance that the SEC came out with recently regarding um, disclosure of preparedness and incidents. So we're gonna talk about that for the, a good chunk of this. Um, the last uh, session, I alluded to some uh, this, this, so an article that uh, I wrote a few months ago talking about the testing of the independence of the control performer. So I'm gonna dive into that in a little more detail here as well. So they're really kind of two unique, very powerful and, and important topics that um, hopefully you guys will learn something from today. So this uh, webinar is available for um, in the live session for uh, CPE. So you need to be uh, available and particip participating actively reviewing this, this session for, the, for 50 minutes of the hour that we're going through topics today. And then if you're interested in getting um, an email or a CPE certificate, you can email us, uh, open a ticket with us at support at your PRA.net and we will send you a certificate in, in response. So a lot of prerequisites. Um, this we've I've put all these prerequisites uh, prerequisites up in the past webinars, but um, I've just added the one, which is we have our part four of the series. Eventually, we're going to package all these together and let you guys have access to the logins, or you can reach out to the Safe Pass team if you want. I'm need a particular uh, uh, URL to some of these training classes or these uh, webinars that have been recorded in the last few sessions. But there are a couple of things that we would suggest if you have not attended one of the prior webinars. Uh, we would suggest getting kind of a high level overview of how, what roles are, roles, this uh, first custom roles, data security policy privileges. Oh my, is a webinar that Donna Curtis did. She's our IFPI Cloud Practice Manager. And she did that and we recorded that for you and you can get a C, uh, one hour CPE. And then we did um, webinars specifically for 23A and 23B on IFPI Cloud and you can get webinars or get CPE for those as well. And we have a special offer for those that are attending. Um, there's another hour and a half class that we'll provide you for free. So in addition to the um, hour CPE today, if uh, if you stay through the whole session, you can get up to four and a half hours of additional CPE um, with these uh, pre-built uh, classes and webinars that we recorded for uh, our, our learning trap, our learning platforms. So if you're not familiar. EP Risk Advisors has um, a full element and uh, we have over 40 hours of classes right now. Uh, we keep losing that, uh, you. Give you some um, some very minute in detail. Mouth. Maybe discussions. Please, be interested. Yeah, I'm sorry. It might be a little bit weak on the on the Wi-Fi side, so I apologize. Let me uh, do an SOS with the family and make sure that they're not on streaming or something. So give me a second. The beauty of internet and work from home, right? Okay, well, I uh, apologize for that. 
Um, so if you're not familiar with the series of webinars we've done, uh, we did the first one on role design, um, the second one on user provisioning, the third one on user access uh, reviews. Um, that was actually the fourth one. Uh, we did uh, some discussions on role change management, patch change management, develop, development change management. Um, so user access reviews and development change management was part four. Now we're on part five, which is um, we're talking about the cyber incident risk analysis, preparedness and the risk analysis, and then testing independence of control performers today. And we have another session coming up in two weeks, which is looking at look back procedures and license exposure. So this two-part series, I've talked about the first section, we're gonna talk about um, the cyber risks. And then the second, we're gonna look at the testing of the independence of control performers, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. So we, uh, when we put out this first series, we first put out the series, we didn't have a full appreciation for the timing of when the SEC would uh, come out with their guidance. So it's a uh, good timing on our part to be able to give you some feedback and uh, best practices related to maybe how to respond to um, the preparedness side and then the disclosure side. And I think since we're focusing purely on ERP cloud and HCM cloud in the series, uh, the, uh, the the challenge really is, is painting the, the big picture as it relates to cybersecurity risk. And from our perspective, um, an article I came out with uh, just recently, or it's actually coming out tomorrow in our newsletter, talks about um, cyber risk for SaaS applications. Now, uh, in a traditional view of cyber risk, uh, most of the cyber companies are really focusing on securing the perimeter. So the the big um, you know the the big goal is to not let anybody into your environment to be able to either st steal um, privileged credentials or impl implement um, malware that could you know block your system, delete your data, uh, lock your system. So effectively, you know, kind of the big big uh, things you've seen in the news for companies that have. Um, had malware placed on their system um, or ransomware also referred to. So beyond that, the the uh, the cyber risk companies are, are trying to protect sensitive data and and in some respects, cyber companies are also focused on avoiding fraud. But if you look at the the population of typical cyber companies, they're really focused on penetration testing, the about evaluating the potential risk of fraud and and protecting. Or, sorry. Um, of uh, unauthorized access and uh, the implementation of malware, um, and uh, and then responding to that if there's an incident. But effectively, um, there's a, there's a little bit of uh, data sensitivity. I think that they would be looking at protecting to sensitive data. But most organizations that are just typical cyber uh, companies don't really have an understanding of of how to prevent fraud once somebody gets access to their environment. So their goal is just to prevent somebody from having um, significant access when they come in. So they're really focusing on um, privileged users or administrative access, more often looking at administrative access from an operating system in a database perspective, but not thinking as much about the context of what happens at the application tier. Um, so mass data, uh, you know, mass theft of data from a sensitive data perspective could be done through a database uh, login or accessing certain files from an OS perspective. Um, but the what we typically don't see in a cyber risk um, profile, a company looking at that and, and management's assessment risk internally is what happens within the application tier itself. Um, and in particular, where there's a SaaS application involved. So a SaaS application, as I go on to the next slide, talking about that, <clears throat> the, uh, the perimeter, um, when you think about protecting the firewall or the ability to get into the application itself, the perimeter is really protected by the software providers. So if you're talking about like Oracle for ERP, HCM Cloud, NetSuite, um, SAP for SAP for HANA, Workday for their, their ERP application, most organizations or systems are thinking, well, the, the, uh, the perimeter is really being secured. It's being managed by the software provider that's part of the SOC 2. It's, which, it's what you're doing or uh, it's what you're getting out of the value is not, um, not having to worry about that in the context of those SaaS applications. Most every organization um, has some sort of hybrid environment. So they're maybe having some SaaS applications. And so there's a complex topology, of course, in, in terms of how the network's configured and where they have to secure the perimeter. But if you're looking at it purely from a SaaS application perspective, the perimeter is the internet. So that's the beauty of the SaaS applications is uh, in a work from home environment today, you can log in from home or from a coffee shop or wherever uh, you want to do work and uh, and you don't necessarily have to go through the company's um, network. Now, in some cases there are 
network configurations that play into that these SaaS applications and you have to log in but it's not always the case that those um, kind of the SSO and the integration is required or it's not required for um, all users or all types of users so whereas the the perimeter is is really the the, the issue in the context of uh, on-prem systems the perimeter is pushed out beyond the firewall and you have other things to worry about um, uh, at the application tier that I think that typically uh, the cyber companies in the CISO doesn't have don't have a, a full kind of arsenal of of, uh, of tools to be able to protect um, not ransomware but but what we would consider uh, data security and fraud. So data security is certainly um, an issue for organizations. Nobody wants their data stolen, and if you're using whether you're using um, HCM and payroll or financials um, and in the U.S. or in in, in, uh, in Europe perhaps. There's different regulations of what defines what data needs to be protected and, and what the, uh, the the penalties are, so to speak, from a compliance perspective um, or from a regulatory perspective as it, as it relates to having data breached. And what's kind of interesting um, from a U.S. perspective is uh, 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 there isn't kind of the, the bite it, it seems to be in the U.S. environment. Certainly there is in, in Europe from a GDPR perspective. And even the organizations that are having their data stolen, their compromised credentials or, or other data, um, uh, user data that, that's getting breached, um, there's often not really much of an impact from a, from a stock price perspective, maybe a short-term blip. And, and whereas a few years ago, you used to see those organizations come out um, knowing that they're, you know, they failed in, in, the, in the protection of uh, sensitive data, they have offered to pay for, um, um, fraud detection or identity protection type um, services uh, for a period of time, and there's been a, a physical cost, if you will, or an actual cost of uh, of a data breach. Um, it's it becoming increasingly normal that those data breaches don't necessarily um, come with a, a, a direct financial cost. And I think that from a U.S. perspective, the street isn't really punishing organizations. It's becoming almost commonplace in many respects. Um, not that that's not important, and then not that there's not, um, you know, significant, you know, broader issues of, of uh, loss of credibility, and certainly there's more regulatory risk, and in, in, I think in Europe um, relative to G GDPR than, than there is in some of the re regulations in the U.S. Um, so the next topic I think that is 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 even more relevant to what we're going to talk about today is fraud, and um, the 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 concept of fraud can be a lot of different things, but the the easiest way to describe what fraud would look like in the European environment, a financial environment, would be um, misdirecting payments that are happening, either employees um, or suppliers. And so that's a common thing that we we help organizations do is we help secure um, supplier master or employee master and put controls in around what's going to be subject to workflow approval process, what's not, um, what um, type of logging's available. Uh, to track inserts, updates, and deletes and changes to that data. Who's monitoring that? Is that monitoring? Is it detective um, after the fact? Is it is it preventive before the fact? Uh, but that's a big uh, it's a big area of of risk for organizations is making sure, like particularly on the supplier side, that's our our favorite topic. I'll talk about that as we go through this process. That um, supplier master data isn't being undermined and the payments either on a check or a ACH or an EFT process being redirected to a fraudulent account. So what cyber companies typically don't do is they don't really get into the application tier. They're, they're looking at the infrastructure and around the application tier, but they're not actually looking at what happens within the application. So we're going to um, argue as we go through this process, and I've argued through the series, that access controls need to be tested to protect, to protect cyber risks. And then you're going to use access control software to help evaluate um, the impact of, uh, of a cyber breach. So we'll talk about that in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, other things that need to be uh, secured in 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 a uh, ERP cloud environment, in particular is MFA and SSO configurations. So um, there's typically an SSO provider, identity management provider that gets integrated to set up identities and to do provisioning and deprovisioning, and that's part of what SafePass has to offer in their in their suite. Um, those things have to be configured um, and uh, for the um, application itself, there are there are always um, a series, one or more, or a series of different, whether it's contingent workers or suppliers or um, 
contingent worker suppliers or uh, sometimes shared accounts, some integration accounts that um, aren't necessarily um, AD, Active Directory, or, or, or identity management users. Um, so uh, the, the, the typical MFA configurations you might have with your identity management provider um, may not apply to um, at least a subsection, if not a, a, a small subsection, if not a, a significant subsection of, of uh, user accounts. So that's just no inherent MFA built into your PHCM cloud. And what we've seen is organizations, um, especially where they're pushing out supplier portal, um, being subject to increasing um, phishing attacks. And we've known customers that have had issues with this. So they don't, they haven't um, required MFA for the suppliers. So effectively it's a single, it's a, it's a password um, that is uh, can be given up during a phishing attack. And some suppliers have done that, not knowing, um, well, I mean, I think everybody kind of knows that the possibility of phishing attacks, but effectively falling prey to a phishing attack. Um, and we had a customer we talked to at Ascend last year, they had three different um, suppliers give up their credentials and uh, the threat actor came in and changed their bank account and they, uh, they suffered $250,000 in losses over those three, um, those three suppliers alone. So, that is a real risk. It's it's not only a real risk, but it's an it's a realized risk for some organizations, um, and that is uh, a big part of what cyber cyber companies typically do is they try to make sure that the uh, the folks on the inside are knowing that these phishing attacks are coming, and uh, to um, train them not to you know fall prey or, or, or respond to that. So. That's a big question, I think, if you for if you're running um, financials or supply chain and you're pushing out the uh, the registration, supply registration process and maintenance process, including uh, up until including the the supplier bank account information, how you secure those. And we have a, a couple classes that we have um, that focuses on um, auditing vendor master maintenance, um, both generically uh, for all of your piece systems, and we're building a class right now specifically on. How to, how to audit the um, Vendor Master workflow uh, process and the Vendor Master process more broadly than workflow um, for yeah, ERP Cloud. So if that's something that's of interest to you, that we will have that class probably um, push, pushed out by the end of September. The class that's generic for all vendors, for, we have an ERP agnostic class that goes into um, how uh, examples of different systems using ERP Cloud is one of those, but EBS and NetSuite is other examples. Um, we uh, we already have a class out that talks through the what what risks are what controls are and an in, internal control questionnaire that you can walk through that more broadly um, gives you some of the things you need to be th think about some of the things we'll talk about in this class today. From a um, back to kind of taking it back up to the top level from cyber risk for SaaS applications and looking specifically at ERP or an HCM cloud, um, it's not just the access within the security console, for example, um, or IT security manager, or the core ERP HCM cloud login that has to be evaluated and secured on an ongoing basis. You also have the uh, IDCS layer, and there's a diff different versions of that depending upon what you purchase from Oracle. So you may have a paid, an unpaid version comes with, um, with the ERP uh, HCM cloud license itself, but there are um, upgraded versions so you may have one or the other or both, depending upon how you've um, licensed the applications. And often you'll have an integration, if you're, if you're an integration layer, which could be driven um, by Integration Cloud, OIC. And then um, ultimately there is an OCI login. So there's not just focusing on really one system that needs to be secured, but it's really four, uh, three or four systems, depending upon how you have the applications licensed and what you're using. So I've talked a lot about over this webinar series risks that need to be monitored, and so now we're going to drill into um, uh, this topic a little bit more in the context of cyber. I've mentioned cyber is a risk that needs to be monitored on an ongoing basis, and um, for those that are interested, there's a new article that's just coming out in our newsletter tomorrow. So if you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, I invite you to do that. You can go on our LinkedIn page, and you can see um, uh, sign up for the subscription at the top of our page. So um, I'm a su su subscriber, so obviously I won't be able to subscribe, but um, I think you get the point of, uh, please consider signing up for that because this article um, ties into this. And uh, we have, we've we been doing our, our newsletters for about eight months, it looks like eight editions. So that gets pushed out to you each month with uh, what's happening in our environment, what are upcoming webinars like this one. And then I always, we always have an article that's um, 
uh, cutting edge. So last last month we did one that was um, on AI, and this month we're addressing the topic of the SEC guidance um, for cyber risk for organizations. And what I'm focusing on in that one is some of the topics we've talked about today, what's being missed by cyber companies and where management has um, kind of the right, the partners in this area, what they need to do to supplement what's being provided by their, by their cyber risk organization, their cyber risk partners. So this is a slide we've talked about on the last few um, webinars. Uh, when you're looking at access control risk, it's not just compliance. People think a lot of um, Sarbanes-Oxley have heavy emphasis on um, looking at uh, uh, access controls is focusing on compliance and really over-focusing um, on SOD risk and not focusing enough on sensitive access risks and the use of um, uh, evaluating roles and user provisioning and all those other things we've talked about. So now we're going to hone in more about cybersecurity. I've, I've hi highlighted here Cybersecurity really should be um, a C-suite uh, focus, you know, across the C-suite. It's often the domain or the primary responsibility of the CISO with secondary um, from the CIO, but um, the CFO should care about it from the fact that the, there is now a disclosure that has to happen um, and there's readiness that has to happen. So that uh, definitely brings it into the purview of the CFO. Um, the SOX PMO, it's definitely a compliance risk now. Um, uh, above and beyond traditional, you know, operational and, and uh, disclosure type risks. Um, and and re realistic, I could have added cyber to, to the CEO because the CEO should care as well if the if the uh, if the application um, or applications are uh, are uh, are corrupted or in, in whatever way or the ransomware that is a real risk from an operations perspective as well. So. Part of this series I've been trying to emphasize as we've gone through this is scoping. When you're looking at risk, you need to go beyond compliance. And so there's lots more risk that we need to be looking at. Um, I'm going to hone this in a little bit more specifically on cyber risk. Um, everybody knows what segregation of duties is, or at least I think most people do probably uh, uh, watching this. It's a combination of risk, um, enter suppliers, enter invoices. It's, it's a combination of two things that create a risk. And what I've been emphasizing throughout the series is um, a lot of there's been an underemphasis on sense of access risk. So uh, as I've talked about, when we do assessments, we take a sense of access risk first and an SOD risk uh, uh, viewpoint second. And that's a lot. Uh, a lot of that's because um, often if you have an issue from an SOD perspective, um, the answer is to remove one or the other sides of that. So enter suppliers and enter AP invoices. If they're an AP clerk that's doing invoice entry and they have supplier master maintenance, the right solution is to remove supplier master um, from their from their roles um, or remove a role that contains it. So uh, that the fix is <clears throat> really looking at sense of access risk. So if you go through all the key sense of access risk and you're resolving those and you're verifying that people only have access to the things that they should have access to, and the roles are designed appropriately. Um, then you're going to eliminate most of your SOD risk. Now, there's always cases where there's a role, there's a SOD conflicts, or there can be cases where there's SOD conflicts across roles, which is why you need to look at SOD um, conflicts. But often, what we see when we get into looking at role design is we'll see SOD conflicts within a role that need to be resolved, and those that effectively means that role needs to be needs to be um, customized to remove something, like a buyer role having access to buyer master maintenance. You'd, you'd want to remove the supplier master maintenance from the buyer role as a primary and then those that just have the buyer role won't have an SOD conflict um, but there could also be something that has a supplier master role and a, and a purchasing role that caused a conflict across roles so it's it's necessary to look at SOD conflicts but um, we'd like to resolve um, the issues of role design before we start looking at um, SOD and that's the, primarily what we're doing in looking at issues of role design is looking at sensitive access risks. So when I um, think about the cyber risk for a SaaS application, um, there are several things that I think, um, you know, mass update of data, mass uh, querying of data, uh, and then ability to take over other, other people's accounts and, and other things. So these are the things, kind of our examples of things we look at from a cyber risk perspective. FBI privileges, those allow you to insert or add data or modify data through a spreadsheet upload template process. Um, and the, the one I've used kind of historically, a very high risk area is the import supplier bank account FBDI template. Um, that used to be something that was in the employee role. 
I'm not sure why it was ever there, but that it was there and it provided uh, up until a year and a half or so ago, um, it provided every employee the ability to, to change, a, to add a new default bank account and set it as the set it as the default account for any supplier. So that was a significant, what I would think, what I would call a financially significant risk um, related to an FBDI template that would cause fraud. So we're talking about not only, you know, not only fraud, but that really could be a material fraud. You could have, uh, in my example, um, one customer had $250,000 in losses because of suppliers giving up their credentials. If you um, had somebody maintain several large suppliers and set a fraudulent bank account for a pay run that could become financially significant it could be could be material to the uh, income statement or yeah the, the financial statements as a whole so um you know i think one of the things about that's interesting about the uh the cyber disclosure by the sec is it's really focusing on material fraud risk because that's or the concept of materiality has a very specific purpose and, and management doesn't have to disclose everything that happens that goes wrong in their business from a financial statement or from a stocks perspective they're, they're disclosing what is financially significant or, or the concept of material um, which has a very strict definition related to it and i go into that in the article i wrote that's coming out tomorrow um so we, we wouldn't we want want people to mass update supplier master data or we wouldn't want people to mass update um, other master data, item master, um, customer master data, um, employee master data, or transactions, you know, pay pay calculations or um, uh, invoices, purchase orders, requisitions, those type of things. Those are all available through FBDI. So all of these FBDI mass update privileges or mass addition, if you want adding data in, those would be scoped into a cyber risk assessment. Um, would a CISO have a full understanding of those risks? Maybe, maybe not, but they certainly would have ability to communicate those risks um, and they're uh, to you know the CIO and the CFO and, and the COO. Um, so those are things that really uh, you know kind of kind of cross over all the, the C-suite and the different uh, compliance needs. HCM data load is another mass uploadability. Um, it's a lot focused on the HCM and payroll side, but it has some other capabilities as well. So that's something you want to secure. Um, we've already talked about vendor master maintenance, um, both from the UI perspective, what happens through the through, through logging the application itself, and then what happens through mass update processes as well. Um, uh, stealing data as a whole. So if you have uh, data that's subject to CCPA or PII type stuff, PHI, if there's something in there, and then things that are more broadly um, uh, uh, GDPR type data, um, anybody that has the ability to query data, um, if you think about in the whole entire database, so a, BI, a person with BI admin access or a data model developer, or they have access to high risk subject areas and have the reporting ability um, through those subject areas, those are all things that you'd want to secure. Um, so we're not just looking at update access, but we're looking at inquiry access to, uh, you know, seal and mask the data that would be inappropriate. Um, and then the ability to provision users and add or maintain roles that can change security. You could set up a new dummy user and log in as that. Um, you could make a change to a role to your login or other people's logins, or you could reset passwords and take over somebody else's logins. So those are always going to be keys to the kingdom risks. Um, and then the mass update abilities through APIs and web services. Um, so that's there are web services throughout the application supporting HCM and uh, supply chain and financial processes. And those would need to be secured because those would be mass update abilities. Uh, you may think that somebody's not really capable of executing, or most people aren't capable of executing a web service or an API. Um, but in our modern age, where everything is uh, between um, AI and then YouTube, there's videos on everything. It's not that difficult to figure out how to do something. So you take uh, do a keyword search, you'll probably find something like if you did supplier import bank account for ERP Cloud, you'd probably find a, uh, a YouTube video that shows you how to use that. Certainly, um, Oracle provides the documentation. That's how they train their SIs to do um, integrations and um, projects. You know, loading customers, um, converting data, and then interfacing data both programmatically and manually. Um, they have great documentation. So somebody with a little bit of ingenuity and and uh, the right incentive um, to be able to steal data, commit fraud, or, or what, what have you, 
it, the, the information is all, all available. Um, one thing I haven't talked about in other webinars as I was going through this one, um, I reminded myself that purging of data was also a risk um, that is kind of like data destruction. And if you have, there's a lot of purge abilities. And uh, if, you, um, if you inadvertently purge that data or somebody maliciously purges that data, then that could, uh, you know, take down the, the, the system for a period of time or, um, you know, co have additional costs related to having Oracle restore back to a backup or something. So uh, that is definitely a cyber risk. So all these things here are, are sensitive access risks that need, need, that can be and should be um, evaluated as part of your, your cyber preparedness. Um, and these are all um, sensitive access risks that we have in, in our rule set. So we, um, we uh, as I'll talk about in a few, few minutes here, we have a product called the ERP Armor that goes into um, SafePass software. And we have that for the SaaS applications like Workday and ERP Cloud. We have that for on-prem systems, various on-prem systems like EBS and others, where we can evaluate who has access to these and, and make uh, you as a as an auditor or if you're you know reporting this is so it compliance type role um, or somebody that is, is looking at cyber risk we can give you visibility into what users have access to these things and through what role or roles they have these things and we can certainly help uh evaluate uh, not evaluate but communicate these things to your senior management as to like what the best practices are how um how this information should be uh, managed and accessed in different parts of the organization um, by the way, we can also bring that same message from a compliance perspective. Um, if you're a SOX filer, we can you know, de delineate between how you keep it out of being a material issue. So that's what manual controls can you rely upon? Um, do you have the right manual controls in place? So, uh, and, and, and if it's a monitoring control, a detective control, is there a way to make that a preventive control or make, a, uh, make it a better control than what you have right now? Um, that's part of what we would do is we looked at some of these things like who should have FBDI access or who should have HDM data loader, for example. Um, we would help your organization do that on a one-time basis and an ongoing basis if you have questions as things evolve or you have new, new people coming into your organization that are either looking at this from audit or IT compliance or from a security admin perspective. Um, we have training classes that integrate both our content and how to use um, SafePass software to be able to test um, test these type of different types of access controls. And I talked about this in the last class. I decided to add one more thing into this slide talking about kind of scoping risk. Um, we looked at an example of, uh, of a company that has procurement um, system of Coupa and a financial system of work with Cloud. This is a practical example. One of my clients has this and they're entering and maintaining supplier system of record in Coupa and purchase orders. And then that data is being interfaced into ERP Cloud, where it's being used to process um, invoices that are being sent by suppliers against those POs. So the system of record for suppliers and POs is Coupa. Um, don't forget to evaluate whether or not um, users should have access to that, or from a system design perspective, consider the fact that um, you have a system of record. We have also have a, you often have a source system and a target system. One's a system of record. One really should be just the receiver of that data. and and Therefore, in other systems, you um, need to evaluate whether or not the, uh, somebody has access to that. So for example, if you're looking at certain APIs in the financial system and nobody should have access to uh, enter or maintain suppliers or enter or maintain purchase orders, you'd want to evaluate web services APIs and things like FBDI processes to make sure that nobody has access to those in your financial system. Um, in this case, your Cloud, if they did, then, and if that was appropriate, like uh, then that would be something you'd want to make sure the right controls were in place. So if you have controls over supplier master and Coupa, the entry and maintenance of those suppliers, and you still have some maintenance that has to be done by suppliers or it's allowable to set suppliers up in, in the uh, Oracle system as well, then um, you'll want to make sure you have the right controls in place, whether that's workflow or manual review of changes um, and additions to users. So don't forget your ancillary, ancillary systems um, always ask the question, what can be done, um, not uh, what should be done. And your your target population from risk is to look at everything that can be done and to figure out whether it needs to be secured, nobody having access to it, or, or the controls are in place. If let's say you can't secure it or you don't feel comfortable that those controls will continue to be in place, you'll wanna make sure you have some type of detective control. 
So I, I'm going to go through, um, those who have been on other sessions, I'll just go through briefly what is ERP Armor. Um, ERP Armor is, in ERP, in ERP Cloud terms, it's privileges mapped in a sense of access risks. It's duty roles mapped in a sense of access risk. It's data security policies mapped a sense of access risk. And combinations of those or pairs of those are built into segregation duties conflicts. Um, in this case, I want to focus on the things we've already talked about, um, uh, the ability to mass update data, purge data, or um, commit, so commit data theft, um, steal data, or, uh, or fraud. Um, here are some rules that we have that do that. So like the SysAB and REST API processes, that would look at like the Access FSCM Integration REST Service, which is the mega um, API, if you will, for um, the overall application for financials and supply chain. This was in the employee role um, as well. I've talked about a lot about the supplier bank account, um, uh, FBDI privilege being an employee, employee role. This, uh, this uh, REST service was in there as well. It got removed. Um, so it's in a lot of roles. It's in a lot of seated roles. It's, it's one of the primary drivers behind uh, us customizing roles, the end user roles throughout the financials and supply chain place. There's no reason for this. Um, the, the, the API or the REST service is not necessary for the user interface access to work. Um, that's very different on the HCM side. HCM, um, certain um, APIs are required for the UI to work. So if you have, you're entering maintained data on the HCM side, it does require some APIs to be able to uh, process that data. So there's very different differences between the two, between uh, uh, HCM and payroll and uh, financials and supply chain. Talked about H HCM data loader um, that has the ability to mass update data um, throughout the HCM area. Uh, transactions and master data. It also has the ability to um, set up a new users and assign roles to them through a, a import process. So that isn't just an HCM process, but it is a core security process as well. And that is a primary risk of setting up a fake user or adding um, roles to users that already exist. So we want would want to secure that. And then, then there are you know dozens of different purge processes throughout the applica uh, app application that uh, need to be secured. Um, most of those should be um, an, uh, accessible only to IT and probably only to, only to a job scheduling process where you have an approval to be able to um, purge data on a regular basis. I, I'm added a few, a few comments in here because uh, down here below, um, uh, there's different categories of users. And even with an IT, um, management often takes the easy route in many respects and say if that's an IT user they can have elevated access or they can have that we're not as concerned about them because they're quote unquote trusted users and um, I think that gives you kind of a false sense of security in many respects in that um, IT users are often your biggest threat they, they know what they're doing it's not that they're you know less they're less honest than other people it's just they have more access and so um, as I think about the as we think about roles that are being designed for um, organizations, um, there's different categories of IT users. You have a support person, you have a maybe somebody that's on the help desk. The help desk could or could not be resetting passwords. Um, there are few people that reset passwords in a help desk capacity. There's a there's a, there's the business analysts. Um, there's the security administrators. There's the report developers. Um, very different, various different people. They all don't need access to everything. So. There are, um, are some people that are authorized to make configuration changes, some people that are not. So when you think about what roles um, out of, uh, that are seated that are that have things like um, um, report writing capabilities um, or mass upload abilities or uh, REST services or APIs that can do mass updates, um, you drill into what are the requirements based upon what they should be doing um, and not don't just put all IT in one bucket. And then you have other third parties that are outside of uh, the systems uh, or outside of your organization, system integrators, maybe a managed services team. Um, uh, and you have, you know, short term and long term, you may have some um, advanced support team from Oracle. And even the SI, you may have an interim team and then a long term team. And, uh, you know, the, the, the key is to just evaluate what, they, what management feels comfortable that they should be doing and then making sure that the roles that are assigned to them don't include things that allow mass updates um, and have some sort of some, some sort of cyber risk that you'd have to uh, 
consider or you'd rather not consider for certain groups of users. So be fine-grained in your um, identification of roles or development of custom roles to be able to meet these different areas. And don't just take, you know, I would just say like one example is that when the system integrator says, hey, we need the AIC role, the application implementation consultant role, we need that for hypercare. You have to ask yourself the question, is that really, are they really going to be authorized to do everything from, from within that role? Can they provision users? Can they assign roles to users? Can they do mass updates to data? Um, maybe they shouldn't be doing anything um, uh, as it relates to changing data in production uh, and they just need to see data and you'd want to give them the only access or perhaps design um, roles that can give them a view only user to see data in production. So push back on, it, on your SIs when they go live and make sure management, management feels comfortable. Um, having the uh, access for the different groups of people that um, would be appropriate for their risk tolerance. So what do we do when there's a breach? Uh, we've talked about how to secure things in the front end. Question is then is what do we do in the back end? So first you have to identify the accounts that were compromised and the timing and the duration of the breach. So that is, sometimes not an easy thing to do but that's your starting point so like we have uh one account that was breached like my example um the uh supplier master scenario there was a uh, customer had um three of their different suppliers give up their credentials so was that one fraudulent payment that was sent or was there multiple fraudulent payments that were sent that wasn't detected until the second or third or fourth payment was sent um did was there a so it's like the timing of the breach. So how that what when was the initial breach and when was the how, what was the duration? Um, obviously, by the time you identify that breach, the you know resetting passwords or doing whatever you need to do to be able to pull that back in and stop the the bleeding, so to speak, happens. But then you have to go through the analysis. Um, where access control software really becomes valuable is evaluating the activities and the data access the accounts had. So once you identify the two or three or four users, then you can look at the activities they have. You can look at the roles. And this is where our content becomes very valuable, is that we're um, risk ranking uh, each of these sense of access rules. And then we're saying, these are the activities that can be done through the sense of access rules. So if it's HCM data loader, you may think it's just, for example, HCM data is like, well, we don't have, we're not using HR payroll, so we don't really care if they had access to HCM data loader for a period of time. You forget the fact that potentially they could set up users, mass upload users and, and assign new roles to users. Um, the IC role and other implementation roles um, may have reporting abilities that you don't feel comfortable with. Uh, so it's it's not easy to say let's just pull everything a role has and come to the conclusion as what what a you know threat actor could have done in that. So that's where the access control software is good. You identify the accounts, you um, use safe pass with our our content your armor, and we identify then um, what are the what are the activities. And then the step, the third step is assessing the impact of that, of that breach by evaluating the activities that were performed during the period of the breach. And that's where it really gets hard. It's easier to say, what do they have access to than to say, what do they do with that access? And that's really um, uh, looking at what we call look back procedures. And it's, it's looking at the combination of transactions, mass data, master data and configurations. Um, and we're going to go into this in the next section in a little more detail because there is some um, automation that SafePass has in this environment that I want Bob to show a, a demo of um, next time around. For now, I'm going to say um, there are lots of logs. That, uh, from an auto log perspective, there's lots of ga uh, gaps and bugs. And so um, we track um, uh, uh, deficiencies, if you will in uh an audit policy so this is our, our our tracking document we've been building for uh several years that looks at enhancement requests that we and others have been logging um in this case i just filtered on audit policies so this column c is just looking at where there are gaps in audit policy so i'll give you one of my favorite examples well i can talk about a couple of them um at one point in time, uh, when somebody would turn off logging and turning back on, so man manage audit policies is the is the privilege. If they had access to that, and that was in a role that was in the AIC role, so and um, so like your system integrator could have had that for forever, and you, they may or may not have used it. But the question you have to ask is if the if a if a if, a, uh, if an account was breached that had access to that, did they turn that off? So there was there a period of time where logging wasn't available, or a whole control environment was undermined. 
um, up until December of 2021, you couldn't even answer that question. Um, we logged um, two different enhancement requests, one focusing on the core auto policies and the second one focusing on functional auto policies that was delivered eventually by Oracle December 21 um, as a combined um, enhancement request. Another one I like to bring to people's attention that's a pretty significant issue is um, SOA Suite. So SOA Suite, uh, the disabling, oh, sorry, disabling approvals through the transaction console. We, we think that realistically, um, the turning on and turning off of workflows uh, as part that you can do through the transaction console, um, that, uh, I'm just gonna see if I, maybe I can pull this one up. Um, that, that probably was, should be in the SOA suite log. So the BPM admin or the, the workflow changes being made through BPM admin, that's actually logged um, via SOA suite. So we logged this with the SOA suite team or we attempted to and said, hey, if I go into transaction console and turn off something, turn off a, a workflow process, especially on the HCM side and turn it back on, there'll be no evidence that that, um, that uh, disabling and re-enabling is turned back on. So this is uh, an old screenshot of the transaction console and you have this bypass approvals. All you have to do to turn off a workflow process is come in and, and check and uncheck this, turn on, turn it off. So this is a good example, something we've logged. Uh, it's been over, almost two years now. No, I'm sorry. It's probably logged, been more than that. That was the last update. So we logged this in June of 2020. So it's been over three years since we've logged this. We tried to get them to log this as a bug and this still isn't fixed or it's the quote unquote enhancement request hasn't been provided. And this is you know, a pretty heavily voted enhancement request. So I could go on for hours about this. The, the point really being, when you get into looking at the impact of the change, you have to ask yourself the question, what data do I have to evaluate the, severe, the, the impact of the breach? Um, so you can look at audit logs. And so whenever there's um, audit policies turn on and it's tracking inserts, updates and deletes, that's your most detailed source of all data. But there are gaps. Um, and those gaps should be considered by Oracle or uh, by management when, when evaluating the impact and a lot of the times what you're doing then is you're looking at base table queries. You have to then ask the question, um, if let's say they had journal entry capabilities for FBDI, or let's say they, heaven forbid, had like an AIC role, how do I get a handle on all the tables that um, they could have done something in, in the entire database? And you, will, no, you wouldn't necessarily have to look at the entire database. You wanna look at what they actually have access to. That's a big part of this then is, um, going in and saying, okay, they have these roles, these roles have these uh, privileges or duty roles that give them access to this information. Let's get our population. Um, and that then drives us to then ask the question, where are we gonna get the data to support what they've done? So we're gonna talk about that in a little more detail, a lot more detail in the next training class, um, session six, because we're gonna look at look back procedures. Section six also, six also is gonna look at License risk, um, which is another thing we can we uh, we can help you guys do using um, SafePass software as well. So that's a little bit of a teaser on look back coming up for the next session. I'm going to go into now part two of this, and um, I did talk about this a little bit in the last session, but uh, the uh, the to kind of set the stage um, for those who have been around, you know, for a long time, old guys like me. Um, the Sarbanes-Oxy, which was really coming out of 2001, 2002, a lot of fraud happening in that time frame. One of the big concerns was management override of controls. Um, so management had to put a framework in place where, where there was a, you know, a lot of, frankly, a lot of organizations didn't have a, a document, a risk control matrix, or it wasn't well documented or it wasn't maintained. So um, part of Sarbanes-Oxy was putting in controls and like, is it a manual control or is this, is it a system dependent control? Um, so, uh, that was a big part of like bringing up a SOX program and it still is a part of big part of bringing up stock pro SOX programs and maintaining those on an ongoing basis An evolution of the applications may change risks and that may change the way that you have controls defined. Um, there may be some feedback from internal external auditors that cause management to make uh, changes to controls on an ongoing basis. What I really want to focus on. One of the primary risks that uh, that was uh, was being addressed or was attempted to be addressed as part of Sarbanes-Oxy was management override controls. 
that was happening a lot at the time of Sarbanes Oxley. And there's some famous cases. We have, a, if you're interested, we we uh, we have a podcast on. Uh, it's called Fraud in the Office, and uh, and what we we chronicle is some of the the greatest frauds in our time. And one of the one of the uh, the the the, uh, the uh, um, uh, case studies we did uh, recently was on Enron, which is kind of the granddaddy of them all of, of from a fraud perspective. It's kind of kind of was the straw that broke broke the camel's back that led to Sarbanes Oxley. Um, now, is it think if, if you as you think typically think about access control testing or IT dependent risks, um, traditionally an IT auditor would think of a, a configuration or access control as having IT dependent risks. So there's a configuration we're relying upon in the system, or there's a um, automation of you know segregation duties between two roles. Um, that could be workflow based as a configuration, or it could be um, role based as it relates to access controls. But um, I what I Pretty sure people aren't factoring into uh, the, the the population of um, IT dependent controls or reports. I mean, to some extent, reports get identified and then get evaluated. There's the completeness and accuracy testing that has to happen by auditors. That's being done on a regular basis. So how do you substantiate either a CD report or a custom report is complete and accurate so that when you're executing the control, it has it's, it's both accurate and it's complete. What, uh, what most auditors are missing, I think, in today's world is that it's not just enough that the, the data is complete, but the person actually reviewing the data and executing the control has to be independent. So they have to have, to have control performer independence. And um, I'm pretty sure based upon the way that this the, the process would have to go in most organizations that it doesn't happen. So the third dependency in terms of looking at um, the uh, what the system dependency is 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 there a report or is there data being relied upon for the execution of that manual control? Um, so an example, um, if it says if a control says the CFO reviews all mon manual or material non-recurring journal entries recorded by the corporate accounting groups, most auditors when look at this control they say oh that's a manual control I don't need to involve my IT counterparts in this control. So the financial team would say I'm going to pull a population. They may have the IT team work with them on the population, or they may already have their queries already pre-built, or they may um, get management to run a query for them that gives them that data. If the financial team doesn't involve, doesn't identify the fact that the CFO has to be independent. So, can the, if the CFO was reviewing their own journal entries and they're approving those journal entries, then he's that he or she's provided the ability to override the control. So you can just say, oh yeah, I did that journal entry. I know it's complete and accurate. I'm approving my own journal entries. So uh, it being a manual control, if I said that to, 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 to an auditor, I said, is it okay for the CFO to approve their own journal entries? So they say, well, no, th th but, but, um, but that's effectively what you're not testing by evaluating whether the people that are executing the controls have access to the things that they're overseeing in that control. So the question I would ask here is, what is the system dependency based upon this control description. Most auditors would say there isn't one because it's a manual control. Um, how should you test this control? That's the question. So when I have a training class on this topic, and those are the two questions we ask in the training class, and I ask auditors to pause and say, what are your, what are your answers? The answer is um, the system dependency is a report and it's used in the execution of the control. So how should you test that control based upon that? You should be evaluating that the person or people that are um, that are performing the control don't have the ability to enter journal entries, and you should also be testing the completeness and accuracy of the report. Most or most auditors will test the completeness and accuracy of the report. They will not confirm that the CFO he or she has access to the journal entries to confirm that the CFO is actually independent in their assessment of or, or execution of that control, and that is a massive gap in the external and internal audit communities right now. So. Where would how would access control software come into play? Um, you would say, look at who, tell me who the CFO is, or if there's a, is a different title, like it's a warehouse manager or something. What are the names of those people? And then what are their login IDs? And then I would want to run a sense of access analysis against those login IDs and see if, in this case, they had access in the system to enter non recurring journal entries. So every control owner effectively should be doing that for 
what is it they're doing in the control? They're performing an uh, analysis of um, uh, physical inventory. They're looking at journal. They're looking at journal entries. They're looking at um, AR transactions. They're validating that credit memos haven't been um, or ha have been pro have been properly authorized. Well, whoever it is throughout the entire period of the audit should not be having access if they're if they're independent. So they're not giving the ability to override controls. So this is a massive gap in the audit community that that, uh, that we've uncovered. I wrote an article on this a few few months ago that I think has a pretty significant um, unfortunate ability to um, cause a lot of issues. I think um, in the external audit community, it could if the PCLB really became aware of this and started um, evaluating this as a control that hasn't been missed. Um, and external auditors in particular aren't being done, it's gonna cause a lot of problems in the external audit community, let's put it that way. Um, so if you're interested in kind of reading this in more detail, it's a, it's a high level snapshot of this functionality or this uh, this risk. Um, there's a there's a uh, article I can send you that goes through this in a little more detail. It's called Lack of Control Performer Independence Testing is Systemic and Why It Matters. It matters because that was really the heart of Sarbanes-Oxley. Like uh, that was one of the most important things that came out of it is management has the ability to override controls and it's still happening across the board, right? So FTX is a good example. We did a podcast on that you know, where the, uh, the CEO had access to be able to steal wallets. Like how did he have the ability to, to steal wallets? Like why wasn't his access to, you know, his privileged access or his, 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 his oversight of those probably system accounts, to generic accounts, why wasn't that identified in an access review um, that the CEO has access to you know, highly privileged roles. So uh, that's you know one example in, in modern times. Um, uh, there's I mean there's definitely other podcasts we did. We, we did one on Amazon, Amazon fraud. There's a bunch of people that had the ability to um, enter, maintain suppliers, and prove invoices related to the suppliers. That was one of our early podcast um, articles. It's just a lot of examples in today's in today's. Uh, environment because just not good testing over access controls and this this particular topic of control performer independence testing isn't even being tested by internal external auditors that that we can tell. So that's my um, big pitch for the day. Um, a couple things to wrap up. Um, I've talked about like where are you as an organization or where are you as an advisor if you're if you're on the advisory side. Um, how can you help um, increase the, you know the maturity of your companies or, or your clients' controls environment. Um, I think a big part of that uh, in the new era of SaaS, SaaS applications, where there's two 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 patches or four patches, um, depending upon you know who you're using. Four patches for SAP, four patches for Oracle UB Cloud, two patches for Workday, two patches for NetSuite. Every two to four times a year, there are patches being applied to the environment, and you want to keep your investment in safe pass current. So if you're running SafePass software and you're and you're testing access controls, you want to make sure you always have the latest content. That's what we do. We have we are called a risk content company, and um, a subscription uh, annual subscription gives you um, unlimited risk advisory services. So you'll never have to sign another SOW again. Uh, we look at either quarterly or semi-annual patches and make updates to the sense of access rules and segregation duties conflicts. So it's quarterly for um, ERP Cloud. We will we will have calls with you as uh, on a quarterly basis to review progress of remediation and talk about what's new, um, what you would want to change in your roles based upon those patches. Uh, we can help you either implement SafePass software or if you have new administrators that aren't familiar, we have our own training that we built. Um, those are those recorded training down at the bottom and we have a 24 seven um, uh, support desk just like SafePass does in terms of supporting applications. You guys can log a ticket at any given point in time. If you are interested in kind of the more deep dive version of look back procedures and how uh, safe, how we'll paint the picture of what's available in the application um, and go through that in a little more detail, but also um, understanding how SafePass um, monitor pass can fit into that, then you'll have the ability to uh, see some of that as part of look back procedures. And then we're going to talk about license exposure um, in the next month, the, the session in two weeks, um, which a lot of organizations are dealing with um, license audits with Oracle right now, kind of kind of cannibalizing their, their customer base is what I call it. Um, so you can register, look on LinkedIn, and then uh, that our newsletter is coming out tomorrow with that article that we have in the SEC. You can click on this link, go to our LinkedIn page and uh, sign up for that newsletter. 
And then if you want to take, uh, we have a we have a class that we wrote specifically um, why access control should be tested for all in-scope systems, kind of going through this topic of how you scope systems and then how um, you're scoping SOD intensive access within the system that then will give you a broader broader appreciation, I think, of how valuable um, the SafePass software is to test access control. So with that, um, thank you for attending. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to, um, to me um, or uh, which my email at the bottom here or log a ticket with us. And then we do have a lot of learning. So if you are coming up on your end uh, CPE requirements, maybe you're an auditor and uh, you have a certain quota, um, we have a bunch of classes that are kind of cutting edge. We got an AI class um, that's brand new that came out recently as an example. Um, but we in general, we have two, uh, 240 hours plus of CPE um, that uh, is fairly cost effective on demand and um, has some great teachers, including me being one of them. So, to, so I ho hope you'll take advantage of that. I appreciate you guys this time and I hope to see you guys next month. So have a great day. Thanks everybody.